congratulations, Michael, on finishing another book about Greek tragedy. Uh, its title is Electra's Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and it will be published uh, November 1st, 2023, but it's already available on Amazon for pre-order. Um, so let's begin with uh, what inspired you to write this work. Of course, I love I, I love Greek tragedy, and that is inspiration enough. But the interesting thing about putting these three plays together is that Aeschylus and Sophocles and Euripides, of course, wrote lots and lots of plays that are lost to us. But of the plays we have, um, there's only one plot that all three of the great tragedians wrote on. Um, and it's the, the electric story, the, the story of uh, Orestes, who's been you know, either in exile or away from uh, his home for all these years, comes back and he and Electra somehow together uh, plan to kill their mother and her uh, and her lover, husband, Aegisthus, for having murdered Agamemnon their father. So a simple plot. And um, and the interesting thing is the way in which Electra differs in the way she's represented in the three plays. And I thought, well, that'd be a really fine way to understand if you've got the same story in front of you, you've got them treating it in different ways. It, in a way, is a, a, a magnificent opportunity to see how they might differ from one another. So thinking about, you know, them in that way. Um, and, uh, and, you know, as it turns out, I think they're not as different as they look on the surface of it, but that's the sort of scholarly reason, um, which is real. Uh, and the, the non-scholarly reason is that, um, that, um, these plays, the Electra story really deals very with, with this very deep tension within human beings. Um, I think I start the book somewhere in the book by quoting, uh, Genesis, um, in his image, he created them, man and woman, he created them. And that's not exactly the translation I use, but still good enough. The standard translation shows you a real puzzle that um the old testament uh and then following it the christian tradition um begins with that human beings that that god says that, that whoever is writing the bible which is itself an interesting problem <laughs> um says in his image he created the man and woman he created them that sort of indicates that um these two things are welded together uh man and woman and then, of course, that plays itself out in the Greek tradition in all sorts of ways. It's, it's the central theme of Aeschylus's Oristia. Um, first time Clyde Mestre is mentioned in the, in the Agamemnon, she's called a manly woman. And the play, the third play, the, the, uh, the humanities ends with, um, really a contest between these old female pre-Olympian goddesses and these explicitly male Olympian gods with Athena somehow the, 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 the theme, the goddess who has no mother straddling the difference between the two. So I'm, I'm wandering, but I'm wandering around a fixed point and the fixed point is that, that, um, the combination of male and female that is somehow present in anthropos in human being and constitutes human being that's an extraordinarily interesting issue and you know the the, the sort of contemporary um <laughs> problem that goes along with that is that in the biblical tradition in the greek tradition it was somehow understood that to understand human beings, you have to understand how those two are related. And for a whole bunch of complicated reasons in our contemporary world, it gets hard to, hard to, hard to think about that problem. We, it, it becomes almost immediately a political issue. 
And when it becomes a political issue, it becomes a moral issue. And as soon as it becomes a moral issue, you have righteousness on one side or righteousness on the other side. And um, that gets in the way of thinking because you, you're, it's not possible to, to sort of puzzle things out and hold out certain, certain possibilities that um, you, you're, anyway, that's, that was the, there was a short question. The short question was, why did you want to write this book? And that's the long gobble, you know, gobbledygooky sort of answer to the question. Why do I want to write this book? Um, um, that's actually, I mean, in some ways, like you said, it's the only story that all three of them write about. Or what do you think the reason is for that? Why they choose that one as such well, an important story I, I have to immediately story pull for back because, um, you know, they wrote, the, there were hundreds of, of uh, written, and it's the only one we have. And um, so as soon as you add that proviso, the only one we have, of course, it could be utterly accidental. Um, or it could be somehow more than accidental. People held on to them because they thought they were important, but it's hard to make that jump. What we have is three really smart people thinking about uh, this uh, puzzle. It takes different forms. I mean, in, in you know, if just think about in simple ways, the role of Electra in the three plays, um, you get halfway through Aeschylus's Libation Bears, which is the first of the three, um, and Electra drops out of the play altogether. Um, and it doesn't come down to us as Electra. It comes down to us as the coephery, the libation bearers. Um, Electra is on the stage for almost the entirety of Sophocles' play, um, which is called Electra. And it's clearly about her. It's all about her. And yet, if you actually look at the simple action of the play, which is Orestes coming back, meeting Electra, they end up killing Clytemnestra, and he doesn't actually quite kill uh, Aegisthus. He, he's about to kill him. They're walking off stage at the end. But the interesting thing is that nothing Electra does in the play leads to the action being fulfilled. She is, from that point of view, utterly extraneous. She didn't be there at all. The play would be very short, but she didn't. She, nothing she does contributes to the death of her mother. Or, um, her, uh, or, or Aegisthus. And then you have Euripides' Electra, where it really looks as though she's causing everything. Orestes is a sort of tool that she uses and a little simple minded. And, and she, she's really, extra, you know, extraordinarily manipulative. Um, and so you have different takes on the role that Electra might play. Um, I think that Sophocles' play is, in a way, an interesting, um, interesting way to think about how you might split them off. Because you put it in this way: they want to kill Clytemnestra. She wants to kill. She wants Clytemnestra dead because of how she has suffered. How Electra has suffered. This play is all about the suffering of Electra. Um, Orestes comes is in as the agent to avenge this suffering. So it is in a way the splitting off of active and passive. You could say to justify the killing, you need to consider the passion of Electra, what's happened to her. But to do the killing justly, you need to be not an interested party, but a disinterested agent. So justice turns out to be really a interestingly problematic sort of thing because Unless it's, you know, uh, unless it's um, 
the result of some godlike activity. It's it's got to be the result of human action. But the difficulty is that you need to be disinterested, you know, blind and with scales and and so on and so forth. Justice can't have a can't have a dog in this race. On the one hand, and on the other hand, human beings don't do anything unless they have an interest in doing it. So how can you establish either disinterested interestedness or interested disinterestedness? Justice looks as though it requires that. And it turns out that Sophocles' play and the other two plays in different ways are really thinking through what a problematic thing that is. And so um, it turns out that even in Sophocles' play, when you... Um, when you look at Orestes, if you look very closely, you see, oh, he comes in as a sort of dif- disinterested agent. He hasn't been there forever. Uh, Agamemnon is his father in name only because he never experienced him as his father. There are even plot glitches that suggest that, God, it's not even clear that this could be his father. How could it be his father? His father was gone at Troy for 10 years. And he, he comes and, and Agamemnon, when Agamemnon returns from Troy after 10 years, his boy is shipped off so that he won't be punished by uh, his uh, uh, so uh, he's shipped off as a as a baby right Electra saves him by shipping him. but wait how can he be a baby if his father has been gone for 10 years so we're given a kind of uh, a kind of contradiction in the play as so frequently happens in Greek tra- tragedy a contradiction that looks like a Gilbert and Sullivan thing you know my uh, um that shows you once you examine it that there's in a way a way in which forgetting about the actual timeline in order for this thing to work Orestes has to both be um Agamemnon's son and not be Agamemnon's son he's got to care enough to want to avenge his father but he can't be a it can't be vengeance if it's to be just he has to be detached so Sophocles has his way of showing that. If you look at uh, um, the first play, The Libation Bearers, Aeschylus too has his way of of showing that because um, when <laughs> when Aeschylus uh, sets it out, um, Electra opens the play. They're at the tomb of Agamemnon, and she prays for an avenger to come back and avenge her father's death and she prays for her brother to return she never makes the connection and that's interesting right because it's the connection that turns out to be the the problem anyway that you know this i could go on it's not that long a book, but it's a long enough book so that it's clear that I, I could go on endlessly and talk about it forever. So let me just see whether you have anything you want to ask me about. Well, so I feel like there's some ways that they disagree about this. I mean, not the story, because I think what matters more is sort of the conceptual points that they're making mm-hmm. with it. And there's some ways they agree. Um, I think you spoke more to like the ways that they might agree. What ways do they seem to have a different perspective about what this means. Well, um, I think I can back into it by saying the subtitle of the first part of the book, which is about Aeschylus's libation bearers, is called Electra Bound. Um, the subtitle of the second part of the book, which is about Sophocles' Electra, is called Electra. It's just called Electra. And the subtitle of the third part of the book is Electra Unbound. Now, why did I do that? Well, because if you think about the underlying issue of all three plays as the relation between the male and the female, and if this is where I usually get in trouble. I, I, I don't mean it in the way that it at first sounds. I don't mean that women are passive and men are active. We've been down that road and women have no desire to return to that. To that. And I, that's 
that's absolutely un understood on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a long tradition of associating something like passivity with the female and activity with the male. Um, there's a ground for that, uh, a deep ground for that, that has to do in a way with the fact that, um, I mean, I'll put it in a stupid way. Um, there's a contemporary phrase, a word called mansplaining, which is all about how, how men have to always, you know, tell you what's going on and, you know, grab control of the situation. And I think that has something to do with the way in which, um, human beings have an urge to bring to speech their world, to ex to explain their world to themselves and to others as well. Mansplaining tends to mean for others, but, but for themselves and that, um, obviously the Greeks, the Greeks talk about logos. That's what logos does to try to articulate the world. The difficulty is that, um, the very existence of logos means that it's trying to bring something to speech that is not simply spoken. It's referring to something apart from itself. And so when you think about the simple way in which we do it, well, you know, we talk about, uh, we talk about rabbits and you say, that's a rabbit and you give it a name and that helps you to articulate your world. There are rabbits and there are geese and there are donkeys and the, the common noun allows you to make that distinction. And so it allows you to appreciate and articulate uh, differences on the one hand, but on the other hand, the common noun is always a word, a, a logos, that is not the particular thing that it means to uh, bring up into speech. The job of logos is to bring things up into speech. So it looks as though logos always implies that there's an unspoken ground for what it's articulating. And the problem is that human beings being what they are, um, they want to articulate this unspoken ground. That's what, in a way, it's the, the engine that drives philosophy. I want to talk about the most important things, the things that are at the root of everything, the ground, the foundations, the first principles, and so on and so forth. It's, it's absolutely understandable. And it looks as though the temp, the, the, the need to do that is somehow at the core of, um, political life which tries to form the world in a certain sort of way of nomos or law, which tries to, there's a wonderful line in Plato um, in the Minos where Socrates defines law as law wants to be the discovery or the, you could say the revelation of what is law wants to set out the world and say, this is the way, this is the way things are. Um, but of course um, I have a, I have a, drawing and that one of my students did uh after he graduated because i'd used the story so much in class uh that um when my children were in nursery school one child the oldest was in nursery school i went to a parent teacher conference sitting on these little chairs talking to the, <laughs> talking to the teacher and um and as we were talking a block a wooden block was thrown across the room and she looked and said to the the boy who threw the block we don't do that here that's what law does law says we don't do that here but of course you wouldn't have to say we don't do that here if we simply didn't do that here <laughs> it's because you do do that that you have to say no we don't do that here so it turns out that law can never be simply an articulation of the way things are. And in the same way, logos can never be simply an, artic an, an articulation of the way things are because it needs to, it will need to fall short of bringing the particular up into 
this generic world that Logos operates in. In other contexts, in Plato, this world is, um, Plato understands Hades as the, as, as the, as the place where, where the generic and the particular are, uh, combined, uh, with one another. So, um, long story short, um, uh, for these poets, Aeschylus and Euripides, the female points to what can be experienced but not said. And the male points to what makes its way into speech. It's the male is very important. It always somehow shows itself as important, whereas the female is always somehow backgrounded, but underneath it all, the deeper stratum, the more the more important stratum. Um, in Aeschylus, that's the reason why Electra disappears halfway through the play, because it looks like we're experimenting with the possibility that the male can simply do it all on its own. But as soon as she disappears, it looks as though Orestes doesn't need her. The male doesn't need the female. But as soon as he gets in the house, it turns out that he can't accomplish what he's doing without the unexpected help of um, the nurse and the female chorus um, inside the house. So Aeschylus has a way of removing the female in order to show its importance. Then you turn to Sophocles and you say, well, Sophocles is coming at it from a different angle. Sophocles says, no, I'm going to keep her on stage for the whole time. She'll be there. Um, it's called Electra. It's her play. She has more, I mean, she has lines. Um, she has a huge number of uh, proportion of lines. It's about her. And yet nothing she does contributes to the actual action that takes place at the end of the play. So it looks as though what you get is Electra bound in the first play. She's taken out to show why she's important. Electra in the second play, it's thematic. It's about her. It's Sophocles attempt to point to, to, to somehow indirectly articulate the importance of what can't be said. And then in the third play, she takes over. And that's Electra unbound because Electra now becomes the active principal. So there's a way in which she gets presented in a way that allows her to take over the male role, but that in some way covers up what it is that she's supposed to represent. She becomes, in a way, too manly to show what it is that and, and, you know, Euripides knows that, and they all know what they're doing, but it's as though in the libation bears, Aeschylus says, look, I'm going to take her out and I'm going to show you what happened. Sophocles says, no, I'm going to put my intention entirely on her. And that's interesting to, to try to make her passivity, the, the show her passivity and the important, the, the, the importance of that passivity. And then in Euripides, he actually makes the passivity active and articulates it uh, electro mansplains <laughs> in the in the third play and she's um i think interestingly just in silly terms um she's the most impressive the most likable in the in Sophocles play in um there's something very suspicious about her in Euripides, and there's something a little too helpless. Not a little too helpless, there's something too helpless about her in, in the first book. I don't know if that begin that probably begins to answer your, your question. <laughs> yeah, I think that actually painted a pretty big picture for me of where where the book would go. And it's it really speaks to what I still see as a fundamental problem. Like I had an experience not that long ago where I was having a conversation uh, with two people and I, I went, 
I made the mistake to even assume there should be considered a difference between masculine and feminine and got jumped on yeah. immediately with the response being that you, that, that, that's a construction. Any, anything you define as a difference between the two is an utter construction. And, um, and, and, and it actually made me think because then I was put on the spot to define exactly how yeah. I see the difference though, whatever I would have said would have been unacceptable, but it made me also realize to the extent that, uh, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure of what I would agree with as the definitional difference, yeah. but fundamentally there needed to be this dichot, like there, yeah. there was something was lost if we dissolved the two. So I don't know if I, it's less of a question, more of a statement, but what, what you're saying very much speaks to that. And I wonder like with, with this definitional problem of, of, uh, what, how would we define the difference and the necessity of difference? Like, how do you, how do you see, how do you see that, um, maybe more generally? Well, I, um, the first thing one always has to say is that, uh, you have to understand why you get jumped on. I mean, you know, there's a whole tradition of, of making this distinction and using it as a kind of moralistic political weapon that prevents women from doing certain sorts of things and all that. You can't, you can't, one can't pretend that that's not real. Um, on the one hand, and, and on the other hand, I, I, what you said reminds me, and, in the second book of Aristotle's Politics, um, he introduces a man, he, he laughs at him. Aristotle doesn't usually make fun of people, but he laughs at Hippodamus. And one of the reasons he laughs at him is that Hippodamus suggests a kind of court reform that, um, that does away with the black and white distinction between guilty and not guilty, because Hippodamus says, well, look, there are many different, no crime is the equivalent of any other crime, and no guilt is the equivalent of any other guilt. It's all a question of, of, of um, you know, degree. And, you know, a, a really fine court system would allow the jury to make a decision on the basis of that, um, of that difference of degree. So some people are guilty, other other people are more guilty. And so on. and in a way what Aristotle says is, yeah, but how's the jury going to make this, this this decision about degree without thinking about guilt and innocence <laughs> as as the alternatives? It looks as though you're compelled to understand degree in terms of alternatives that you have articulated as though they could be completely separated from one another. So it looks as though that's what's at the root of man and woman. He created them in his image. He created them. They are at once different and the same. And so you can't lose sight of either of those things. And if you, if you, you know, pretend that, that you can discuss, you know, the variety of genders, you know, as though there are millions of them, that really means you can't understand them at all because everyone will be different, potentially different from every other one. And there won't be any way of thinking to think you need these falsely articulated distinctions. <laughs> you, know, you need to, th and you also have to remind yourself that um, as you're using them, that they are not final distinctions, but you can't do without them. And so the problem with moralism is that is that it there's moralism on the one hand where you really think that law is the revelation of being so you think that the principles that you're using are fixed and final and therefore you get quite upset when people when people don't adhere to them but there's a moralism on the other hand that says no 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 those principles are just constructs and at which point you want to say yeah okay but where did the constructs come from and why do we need them and how do we use them and what does it mean to use constructs and can you actually think without constructs and is what you're doing thinking or is it sort of moral, a, 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 a sort of moral, uh, um, condemnation? Uh, and I, 
So I think the last line of the book I, it, it's something like morality is sometimes at odds with thinking. Um, and uh, as uncomfortable as it is to acknowledge that, that's really true. Um, it's interesting that uh, the way, you know, what was it, almost 50 years of college teaching? And it's just not meant as, you know, a final criticism or disparaging in any way, but kids come in as 17 year old, late in late 17 year, late adolescents, 17, 18 years old. Um, they have often gotten used to confusing moral posturing with thinking. And, um, they've often been encouraged to do that by their teachers. I mean, I, you know, that's half of what used to be 11th grade English was discovering, you know, these moral principles. Uh, um, and it's not as though morality is dispensable. I don't mean to disparage it, but you have to, you have to move away from that. You have to be willing to say, you have to be willing to say, well, maybe I should consider the possibility of, and so you have to, you know, you have to, you have to think sometimes unthinkable things in order to think at all. It's a risky business thinking and you can't afford to allow yourself to be too sure about what the limits are and what you're allowed to think. And so, I, you know, you, we have all gotten in conversations like that where you're, 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 you're chastised for even daring to think a certain thing. And I think the important thing is to realize, as I said at the beginning, that um, that doesn't happen for no reason. I mean, that happens because these distinctions have been so often abused. I, I mean, you could put it this way. Man and woman, he created them in its his image, he created them, turns into Adam and Eve. And then Adam, who are real people, sort of, you know, they're, they're representations of real people who have offspring who are treated as, who can be understood to be the complete um, manifestations of these principle, man, these principles, man and woman. And that's what poetry does. You know, it gives you powerful images so that you can explain these things. So you get Adam and Eve, you get poetic images in, you get Helen and, and, and Achilles in, in, in the Iliad. The danger with poetic of poetic images is rooted in the same thing as their strength. The reason they work so well is because they tap into something real, but they usually so are so they can be so powerful that their powerful representation can replace the thing that they're supposed to be representing. So the poem replaces the world, which means that, um, that in a way, law becomes the revelation of what is. The conventional way of understanding things <laughs> becomes um, the way of understanding things. So it's, it's what Shelley, I think, meant by saying that the poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. You can't do, you can't do, <laughs> You can't understand anything with them and you can't understand anything without them. You need the exaggerated representations in order to understand things. And you always have to be careful of the exaggerated representations because they're so, when they get really powerful, you can just, it's so easy to mistake them for the truth, truth of things, which is why I think for, you know, the Greeks, for Plato and Aristotle, um, it, is so important when they say, well, the origin of philosophy is the distinction between convention and nature. That doesn't mean that, you know, the Greek philosopher said, oh, this is the natural and this is the conventional and the natural is true and the conventional is false. That's not what it means. What it means is the ability to distinguish between what you generally take for granted and what it is pointing to that you can't quite get hold of without the taken for grantedness, um, that's the fundamental, that, that's the origin of philosophy. And it's also the origin, it turns out that in its way, it's the origin of poetry. Um, Homer does it, by the way, in the, uh, in, what is it, in the 10th book, I think, of the 
Odyssey, the first time in any literature we have, any writing we have in Greek, that the word nature is used. It's used to describe the moly plant that has, a, uh, Hermes is showing it to Odysseus. You're never told why, but it's what allows Odysseus to escape the enchantment of Circe. Um, and, and Hermes points out that it has a, a white flower and a black root. It, in a way, I think it's not that, and you know, people usually take that to mean, oh, he gave them a root that he could grind up and drink or eat or something in that prevent. No, the point is that the ability to see that something grows from its opposite that it's possible for the white flower to come from the black root. That's somehow the fundamental insight that's necessary in order to protect uh, people from the enchantment of Circe. And that's, you know, the ability to make the distinction between convention and nature. That's all. I've oversimplified that so that I almost feel like I'm doing something unnatural. <laughs> there, there is something about that point though that I think is was so fundamental to what I if I had to point of one of the things I got out of philosophy I think it's that that recognition that whenever someone tell gives you a definition or tells you a story about how you should interpret a certain political event or geopolitical event or um, that that there's always a, a two there's more complexity than the simple narrative that might say this is good or this is bad and that more often than not, it's in those details that you actually yeah. start to, that complexity is being missed, that you actually start to understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, so it's very important um, when this is the connection to poetry, to simile, to uh, similitude. Wherever there's similitude, there's dissimilitude. <laughs> um, it means that um, in a way, the crucial thing is to see that we understand things by likening them to other things. But wherever there's a likeness, there's an unlikeness. I used to, at this point, talking about this stuff in my classrooms, pull out my wallet, take out an aged picture of my wife, which was taken, you know, before we were married, and uh, hold it up to the class and say, oh, that's my wife. And they nod and say he's doing something silly again and then i would say but that's absurd what a strange man this man must be to be married to a you know two inch by three inch piece of cardboard i mean you know <laughs> that's his wife what kind of a life does he have he can't have much of a love life you know um so of course it is my wife it's an image of my wife but to be an image of means not to be i mean it, recognizably not to be so it is on the one hand to be what it is it has to be my wife and on the other hand to be what it is has to not be my wife so that's a picture but a, a logos a speech an account any account is like a picture it has to be what it is and it has to not be what it is that's its job it can't do its job without both of those things being true which means speech can never be perfect speech because to be speech would be to take up into itself everything that it's trying to point to, which mean would mean it isn't doing what its what its job is to do, which is takes us back to where we started. If you think of it in that way, you could say, oh, the impulse to say that's my wife correctly, that is something to do with, with what Davis has been calling the male. And the realization that, of course, it can't be his wife. There's got, you know, it's got to point to something beyond the cardboard. He's not married to a piece of cardboard. That is what Davis has been calling the female. And I think I'm calling them that because Aeschylus is in Euripides in some way, um, uh, called them, called them that. Um, and I, I also see it, um, it, it often takes the form, it, at least in, I can only speak about my time because I, you know, I haven't lived long enough to be able to compare how things have changed, but it feels like whenever we, we have a tendency at this, in this age to focus on the, the positive definition of something and to sort of ignore its perhaps negative or dark side or, or the other component of it that 
sort of may also makes it what it is. So it's almost like everything is somewhat definitionally being whitewashed. And in that we're like missing um, almost half of a lot of the stories. Um, and we, we sort of think these pure things really only have the, the pure side to them, but we don't recognize that they have so much greater complexity as you were describing. Yeah, well, it's, it, but it's also, it's very, very important to see that that tendency that you just described, which is, you know, exaggerated more in some ages than in others, um, is built into the phenomenon itself. I mean, it, it's, it begs you to do that be, precisely because your, your longing is to clarify. I mean, mansplaining isn't a result of, I mean, it may be in its other usage, it's more common usage, but as I've been using it, it's not a result of, you know, a, a born out of a desire for male hegemony. It's born out of a desire to understand. It's just, it gets, it, it gets, it goes too far. It goes crazy. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, I mean, I don't need, I suppose I don't need the detail, but when Herodotus gives an account of the various places in antiquity and um, moves you through Egypt and Persia and the land of the Scythians and, and um, it turns out that um, what's really characteristic of the Greeks, and you know, this is an Herodotian exaggeration he knows it's an exaggeration what's really characteristic of the, the greeks is poetry so you could describe what you've described in terms of the clarity and the light side versus the dark side um you could describe it in another way and you could say oh that's what poetry does it sort of claims to give you the truth but at the same time it calls your attention to the fact that it's not giving you the truth. It's giving you a story, a likely tale. You know, it's not, it's not true. The Electra story isn't true. So poetry invites you, and that both in its stories, it, its stature is fiction, but also simply in terms of the way it tells them, in terms of images, in terms of metaphor, in terms of, you could say the, the problem you described, you just described, could be described in the following way. Oh, I live in an age that reads metaphor literally. As though metaphor were literally true. When I say X is Y, I really mean X is Y. But, but of course, um, if it were simply Y, you wouldn't have to say it was Y. It would simply, you know, be what it is. So this need to say this is that is already got the problem of metaphor, which is the problem is what you described in terms of light side and dark side, um, which takes us back to um, which takes us back to where we started. That's male and man and woman. He created them in his image. He created them. So a common theme um, that I've known in your thinking is the relationship between poetry and philosophy, and we're speaking about that. A little bit here, but can you um, maybe just say a little bit more about that more generally? Well, I think that um, we were speaking about it. I, I think it's built in. It's built into the problem of what it means to speak at all, what it means to have logos, um, and I think it it means that. Um, you put it in a simple way. Um, in an everyday practical way, we know it's possible to uh, write philosophy without writing it poetically. You know, uh, I don't know, David Hume. But on the other hand, um, we know it's possible to uh, write poetry and not do it philosophically. Uh, Ogden Nash. A wonderful beast is the pelican. Its beast hold, it, its beak holds more than its belly can. Right? Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, it turns out that when we admire poetry the most, it is inevitably not just a question of the prettiness of the language, 
But the beauty of the language is inseparable from the depth of the thought that it's carrying along with it. And then it turns out that even David Hume, um, when he is apparently writing non-poetic philosophy um, and telling you that nothing can be uh, in the mind that wasn't first in the senses, when he's articulating a sort of what looks like a simple empiricism in the um, uh, the um, I've lost it. The essay concerning human understanding. Um, uh, he tells you in a footnote that, of course, you don't have to have experienced all the shades of blue. If you were going along on a continuum and there were a gap, you could fill that in. But wait a minute, what has he just done? <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to have been in the senses before it gets in. Uh, into the uh, into the mind, which means that there's a function in human being. There are two things going on there. One is he's admitting that there's something that human beings do that is active, that creates something that they are supposed to undergo passively. But the other thing that he's doing is that he's doing it in a very, in a rather poetic way. I mean, he's not flat out telling you that. He's just giving you a footnote that takes back something absolutely crucial that he supposedly had given you in the text. So it looks as though um, we're always, if we're thinking about what we're reading or listening to, we can't um, do away with the distinction. We, can, we can't do away with the distinction between form and content. And at the same time, we can't simply make the distinction. So when in uh, Republic 10, uh, Socrates says there's that there's an ancient quarrel or difference between uh, philosophy and poetry, poetry and philosophy, I think he says. It's interesting that it's not between poets and philosophers. It's not articulated as a difference between poets and philosophers. So we have another example of what we were talking about earlier. You can't understand the world unless you make that distinction um, between the poetic and the philosophic. But at the same, as soon as you've made it, you have to realize that it's a distinction that's necessary for the sake of understanding, but not a distinction that you'll be able to um, you'll be able to uphold uh, completely because they necessarily bleed in to one another. And, you know, um, what you described earlier is the age of, you know, looking at trying to get absolute clarity and, and not looking at the dark side and seeing the simple rather than the complexity. I think that there has been for a very long time a tendency among some people who study philosophy in a university context to think that um, the goal is to utterly do away with the dark side and not uh, acknowledge the, that understanding it. You, you put the problem simply, I mean, it, that, um, that in order to understand the world, which is presumably the goal, you have to understand why it does not appear as it is. So something like phenomenology, something like a understanding appearances is necessary. But to understand appearances means to understand why they're shaded, why there's a dark side, um, why they don't just jump out at you in all of their beautiful and complete uh, uh, glory. And that is, in a way, uh, that's very much connected to uh the connection that's very much connected to uh, philosophy on the one hand and poetry on the on the other hand. So even when Socrates is apparently making this distinction so clear at the beginning of Book Seven of the Republic and the most probably the most famous philosophical uh, passage in the in in 
in all of Western philosophy when he introduces the cave image where you get being and seeming and, you know, life in the cave and life outside where you're supposed to see, see things in there. But how does it get introduced? He says to Glaucon at the very first lines of book seven, he says, make an image of our soul. <laughs> it is, so it's all presented in a poetic image. Um, and it has to be presented in a poetic image. So that by itself should tell you, well, wait a minute, this absolute distinction between life outside the cave and life inside the cave, that's not so clear. It turns out that what life outside the cave really is, if it's anything, is somehow understanding the truth of life in the cave, what it means that we're in a cave, which is, after all, that's what they're doing in book I mean, you know, the philosophers they're talking about look like they get out and they're free and you can't understand why on earth they would want to come down because it's so wonderful up there and the sunlight never rains or anything like that. It's, it's, you know, so why do they ever go down? They have to be forced out and then they have to be forced back. It's just, it's a mess to try and figure it out on the one hand. Um, but then it turns out that, uh, that once you realize that life outside the cave means understanding how you have misunderstood things in the cave. You could say there's a way in which you don't get out and you do get out. <laughs> you're, you're under. And so there are the philosophers they're talking about, the guys who get out and very happy about it. And then there's Glaucon and Damatis and the rest of them. And they're thinking about what it means that we live in a cave. Presumably, the guys who get out and get to look at things in the sun, they don't have to think about that at all. So there are two kinds of philosophy here. And the question is, which one is really at work? The one they're living or the one that they're talking about? And it looks as well the one they're talking about is another kind of overly clear, overly clarified version. And it's only on the basis of that that you can get a straightforward distinction between philosophy and poetry, because that kind of philosophy, if possible, wouldn't use images at all. Presumably, it wouldn't even use speech at all. You just look and see how, how things are. But once you get immersed in the reality of living in the world, it turns out, in order to understand anything, Socrates has to say, well, make an image. Imagine this, Glaucon, and then, anyway, I'm, <laughs> um, so I think that's the connection between the philosophy poet, the, the connect, the necessary connection between philosophy and poetry that you're, you've been, that you will want to won't start. Um, so in some ways, poetry is always there. Yeah. Um, and if we think it's not, we might just have to look a little bit deeper or from a different, from a different side. Yeah. I think, uh, it shows up in a lot of different ways too. Um, I think it shows up in the way cultural anthropologists, um, good ones interpret cultures. You know, they have, they, they see that certain things that the people who are living them don't necessarily connect. Um, are actually connected in terms of the, the way the patterns of, uh, of behavior operate in a culture. Why that should happen, that's a wonderful and hard question. But, you know, cultural anthropology is a kind of, requires a, a kind of interpretive skill that is not altogether unlike what it means, um, to interpret a book. So we're always interpreting the world in that way because we're always immersed in a world of appearances that is, in order for it to be an, an, a world of appearances, we have to understand it as pointing to something beyond itself. So we have a kind of access, indirect access, to something beyond appearances. But, um, so it's not a, you know, it's not an easygoing relativism where you know you're just interpreting the world in a variety of different no the world pushes you around more than that you're not as free as that but you also realize that you never quite get your hands on what 
on the goods. You know, you, you don't you don't get them finally, even though you're aware of the fact that something is governing your uh, your inquiry. That it's not altogether up to you. You're not you know you're not just lost in a, a sort of relativistic sea where anything could be possible because you're not deciding where you're directed you're sort of following uh you're following a thread um often a greek tragedy is usually thought of as literature or taught as literature um and you always teach it as philosophy and kind of related to what we're talking about right now it doesn't seem like there is a clear distinction between the two or maybe rather literature always has poetry and philosophy kind of there or see i i you know this is a really important question and seems strange when you've been when i've been doing it for my whole life not to have an adequate answer to this question but i have to confess that um so I know that there's a difference between philosophy and literature. I do know that uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, there is a way in which when I teach them, I don't differentiate. In the, I mean, I, I just try to understand them. And it turns out that in order, I found over and over again that in order to be serious about philosophy, I have to pay attention to what you might call its poetic form, you know, the way in which it is presented. And at the same time, I've discovered that in order to be serious about reading, forget about for philosophically or poetically, I'm just reading a tragedy. I want to understand it. I want to get it. I want to see why it's so great. Or reading anything. Or reading anything uh, that you need, that I need to, I need to uh, read it in terms of its meaning. That that's what makes it in some way worth reading. Meaning is hard to get your hands on what, what you mean by <laughs> meaning. But so I know there's a difference. Um, I know that from experience on the one hand. And on the other hand, from experience, I also know that when I actually sit down and have to read a particular piece of writing, I, I, mean, I can't do it any differently from one to the other. I'm, I'm just doing the same thing. It's as though understanding, the act of understanding for me transcends this distinction, even though I know the distinction is that, that there's something that corresponds to it in reality. So um, there's a part of me that's satisfied with that and a part of me that drives me crazy because I'd like to be able to know more clearly what it is that I'm doing. Um, I have a good friend who uh, who has been in recent years uh, writing, thinking about uh, the Old Testament, but before that, you know, studied Greek philosophy and wrote on Greek philosophy. And she has a way of reading, uh, you know, the the books of the Old Testament as though she were reading a platonic dialogue um, and can't resist doing that. I mean, she makes, she sees extraordinary things. It's so magnificent. And yet when pressed to say, well, what's the status of what you're doing, the literary, what, what justifies treating it as though it's written, you know, do you really think God wrote it? Well, Probably not. Do you do you think so? One author wrote it. Well, really. So it's hard. It's 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 a version of the problem of cultural anthropology, where you walk into a culture and you say, "Wow, this makes sense. See, this goes with that, and this goes with that, and this means that, and all this fits together." And then you say to yourself, "Well, wait a minute. Why should why should that be true? You know, why should, why should that be true? It's." It's, 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 it may be the hardest question to answer. Why, why, why I have to read philosophy poetically and why I have to read philosophy, uh, poetry philosophically. But I do know that, um, that in terms of 
what you get out of it, I couldn't do it any other way. I mean, I, I, I would find it so artificial to say, oh, no, you can't do that. You can't, you can't really consider what the consequences of, of the, are of the fact that Socrates says, make an image Glaucon. You know, you, you can't do that. You, you, that's not the way you understand things in the world. You're always putting these two, uh, these two together. Um, well, thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Um, well, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to see you again. I mean, it's, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, um, and, uh, if for those who want to, um, read your reading of, of the Electras, um, the book will be available on Amazon for pre-order, um, starting now and, um, it'll be published and you'll be able to get it starting November 1st, 2023. So thank you very much. Thanks. Since we had this conversation, uh, Michael's publisher uh, generously offered um, 30% off on their website. Um, they're St. Augustine's Press, and they were founded in 1996. Um, and they publish mainly scholarly works, uh, principally in the fields of philosophy, theology, culture, and intellectual history. Um, if you want to support them, you can purchase it directly from their website, uh, and they'll be offering 30% off the book uh, from now until the end of 2023. And the code for that is Electras Davis 30, number three zero. Um, I'll also add that into the description. Um, if you would like to purchase there, that's probably the best because it goes directly to the source.